Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Now, if you, like me, need a bit of a break from all the rise and madness, then I think I have just the thing. An insanely expensive graphics card. Yep, they always work. A few days ago I took the covers off NVIDIA's new GeForce GTX 1080 Ti Founders Edition graphics card in an unboxing video. I covered most of the specifications in that video so I won't go over any of that stuff again here. For more details feel free to check out the written version over at TechSpot. The link will be included in the video description. A big part of this story, other than the fact that gamers can now get Pascal Titan X-like performance for $700, is the new $500 MSRP for the original GTX 1080. As for the 1080 Ti, previously this level of performance cost an eye-watering $1200 US, and knocking a little over 40% off the price tag is no small thing. Since the GTX 1080 Ti won't be anything radically new in terms of performance, especially if you have the Titan XP added to the mix like I will, there really isn't any need to test 20 games. But this is Harbour Unboxed, so, you know. <laughs> Anyway, for those of you who just want to check out the performance in a few select games, feel free to refer to the video index, which I will provide in a pinned comment, as well as the video description. For testing, I will be using my Core i7 7700K rig, which will be overclocked to 4.9 GHz. A few months ago, I moved away from testing stock reference graphics cards for a few reasons. The main reason being that I always suggest you guys avoid AMD and NVIDIA reference cards, and instead pick up the quality board partner versions with bigger coolers that allow the card to run cooler, quieter, and boost more reliably. So then the only reference cards included in the results that you're about to see include the GTX 1080 Ti and the Titan XP, as you can't get custom Titan XP cards. The rest are factory overclocked board partner cards, and I will list which models were used in the video description. I received a heap of requests to show 1080p results, and although it seems strange to me, I'm going to do it anyway since enough of you guys asked. That said, I will quickly gloss over the 1080p and 1440p results and focus mainly on the 4K numbers. I have added the Fury X to the 4K testing, but didn't have time to include it in the 1080p and 1440p results, so hopefully you guys will let that one slide. There are 61 graphs in total, so beware of that, it's a bit of an information overload. Again, feel free to skip to the games that interest you, but if you're like me and think 20 games is a good little start, then let's get on with it. Those seeking extreme frame rates in Battlefield 1 will certainly receive them at 1080p with the 1080 Ti, as it matched the performance of the Titan XP. This was also the case at 1440p, and here Nvidia's new flagship gaming graphics card pushed well over 100 FPS at all times. Now at the 4K resolution, Battlefield 1 looks as sharp as the edges of a generic ATX case. Thankfully though, with the 1080 Ti in charge of the rendering work, it's a painless experience. Here we see a smooth 73 FPS average, while frame rates never dip below 66 FPS. As expected, this again puts it roughly on par with the Titan XP, dropping just a few frames behind. Testing with Far Cry Primal at 1080p, we run into a rather heavy CPU bottleneck at 1080p. Oh, hell, is it okay to talk about CPU bottlenecks in this review? Hmm, I'm not quite sure about that one, so to confuse the fanboys who are all riled up about CPU bottlenecks at the moment, let's call it a CPU speed limit instead. Yeah, let's go with that. At 1440p, the 1080 Ti again roughly matches the Titan XP, making it 21% faster than the standard GTX 1080. Not bad results given frame rates stayed above 80 FPS at all times. Moving to 4K, the 1080 Ti tiptoes ahead of the Titan XP, though with just 2 FPS in it, the performance is obviously very similar. Again, when compared to the standard 1080, we are seeing 20% more performance here. Even with the Core i7-7700K overclocked to 4.9 GHz, we start to run into another one of those pesky CPU speed limits, this time in Call of Duty Infinite Warfare at 1080p. That said, when looking at the minimum frame rate, the 1080 Ti still produced 22% more performance than the standard 1080. It also looked very mighty at 14 40p with an average of 117 fps while frame rates never dip below 100 fps at the extreme 4k resolution frame rate stayed north of 60 fps with the 1080 ti pushing no less than 66 fps throughout our test that made it 35 percent faster than the vanilla 1080 when comparing the minimum frame rate which is most impressive Civilization 6 is a rather CPU demanding game and is therefore quite well known for imposing CPU speed limits. Here we see the 1080, 1080 Ti and Titan XP capped out at 85 FPS. Moving to 1440p, the high-end GPUs are still performance limited. Even at 4K, we find the higher-end GPUs all deliver very similar results. The good news here, of course, being that all cards tested are capable of delivering playable performance at this extreme resolution. 
Deus Ex Mankind Divided was tested using the very high quality preset, and here the 1080 Ti spat out 113 FPS on average, making it a fraction faster than the Titan XP. Moving to 1440p, it held the lead over the Titan while providing a 23% greater average frame rate when compared to the original 1080. Those wanting to play Mankind Divided at 4K will likely have to tweak a few settings as the 35 FPS minimum isn't exactly desirable, not when spending this kind of money anyway. In any case, at this resolution, the 1080 Ti should be at least 25% faster than the standard 1080. The division is very demanding on the GPU, as most games are, and here we see that even at 1080p, the 1080 Ti and Titan XP will still dip below 80 FPS at times. Still, with an average of over 120 FPS, it goes without saying that gameplay was extremely smooth. Performance remains very strong at 1440p, with over 60 FPS rendered at all times. Here we have another game that will require either two GPUs for a smooth 4K experience, or a reduction in quality settings. The 53 FPS average is actually very good, but at times frame rates drop as low as 31 FPS in our test. Doom enforces its own speed limit with a 200 FPS hard frame cap, which we are easily reaching on the high-end GPUs at 1080p. Even at 1440p, the 1080 Ti and Titan XP are locked at the 200 FPS frame cap. Turning up the pixels at 4K, we still see well over 100 FPS at all times on the Titan XP and GTX 1080 Ti. As a result, this made it 24% faster than the standard GTX 1080 for the average frame rate and 20% faster for the minimum. Those playing F1 2016 running triple monitor simulator type setups will no doubt be very interested in what the GTX 1080 Ti has to offer. The 1080p performance is impressive, though it looks as though we're being held back a little bit here. At 1440p, the 1080 Ti starts to pull further away from the standard 1080 with an average of 133 FPS. Now at 4K, the 1080 Ti is good for 81 FPS on average, while frame rate stayed above 67 FPS at all times. This then made Nvidia's new $700 champ 20% faster than the GTX 1080. Cutting your way through hordes of stupidly easy baddies in For Honor is at least slightly satisfying with the GTX 1080 Ti. Here at 1440p we see over 80 FPS and this will help you keep up in the online mode as you change your guard stance multiple times per second. Now at 4K using the extreme quality preset we are still seeing a respectable 55 FPS on average. This then was a 22% performance boost over the 45 FPS churned out by the original GTX 1080. Those of you running 144Hz monitors can take full advantage of all those Hertz in Gears of War 4 at 1080p using the new GTX 1080 Ti. Even at 1440p frame rates are often seen above 100 FPS, roughly double that of those pathetic mid-range graphics cards. I kid of course. Now at 4K we see the Fury X and GTX 1070 struggling to keep pace while the standard GTX 1080 looks quite respectable. The TI model provides an additional 24% performance bump, hitting an average of 57 FPS. For those of you new to the channel, I should point out that in some games, or certain titles that support DirectX 12, I test NVIDIA using DirectX 11 and AMD using DirectX 12. I have discussed why this is in the past, so I won't go over that again. Basically, AMD performs better using DirectX 12 and NVIDIA using DirectX 11. There is no reason for GeForce owners to use DX12 in a game that sends performance backwards for no reason, so essentially I'm testing the API that gamers will actually use. So, using DX11, the GTX 1080 Ti spits out 130 FPS on average, making it a fraction faster than the Titan XP. Moving to 1440p, the Ti was good for 120 FPS on average, and we are starting to move away from that tricky CPU speed limit here. Now at 4K, the average frame rate is reduced to 74 FPS with a minimum of 64 FPS, and once again the GTX 1080 Ti performs very similar to the Titan XP, just a whisker slower. This also meant it was 29% faster than the GTX 1080. Using the high quality preset, the 1080 Ti pushed an average of 101 FPS at 1080p in Mafia 3, which isn't bad though, that's not much faster than the standard GTX 1080. Moving to 1440p, the Ti starts to pull away from the plain Jane 1080, though it is only 13% faster here. Finally at 4K, the 1080 Ti hits full stride, pulling further away from the standard 1080 by a massive 29% margin. Next up we have the game that made parkour cool, and not the other way around. Helping to keep up to speed in jumping over or underneath things at maximum efficiency is the GTX 1080 Ti with a blistering fast 150 FPS on average. Even at 1440p, frame rates average over 100 FPS, another nod then for high refresh rate gaming. 
Even at the 4K resolution using the ultra quality preset, the 1080 Ti averaged 57 FPS, making it 24% faster than the GTX 1080. You probably don't need a GTX 1080 Ti to play Overwatch, but it would be pretty darn cool to have one anyway. Frame rates are pretty insane at 1080p, and even at 1440p we see an average frame rate of around 250 FPS. That said, this is a very CPU intensive game, and our bot test hammers even the Core i7 7700K overclocked to 4.9 GHz quite hard. At 4K, the massive variance between the average and minimum frame rate is now gone, and we're primarily GPU bound at this point. In other words, your typical 4K GPU speed limit has been applied here. Firing up Quantum Break, we see that the GTX 1080 Ti is able to match the Titan XP as expected. What's interesting here is how much faster it is than the standard 1080, even at 1080p. 22% more performance at this resolution is quite surprising. Moving to 1440p, the margin is extended ever so slightly to 23%, and again the Ti is still pushing over 100 FPS. Finally, at the 4K resolution, the 1080 Ti is good for almost 60 FPS on average using the ultra quality preset. That again made it 23% faster than the standard 1080. Playing Resident Evil 7 with the 1080 Ti, we see an incredible 211 FPS on average at 1080p with the quality settings maxed out. That's more than twice the average frame rate of the RX 480 and GTX 1060 graphics cards. Similar margins are seen at 1440p, and again, frame rates are kept well above 100 FPS on Nvidia's new $700 graphics card. Resident Evil 7 looks amazing on a large 4K screen, and a single 1080 Ti can handle the rendering work no worries as gameplay was silky smooth at 60 FPS at all times. As a result, we saw 24% more frames from the Ti when compared to the standard 1080. Rise of the Tomb Raider blew us away with amazing visuals over a year ago now, but even today the game is still one of the more impressive looking titles. Although we don't test a terribly demanding section of the game, the 1080 Ti still looks mighty impressive in relation to the GTX 1070 for example. Moving to 1440p we see that it's 23% faster than the GTX 1080, and incredibly 55% faster than the GTX 1070, which as we know is roughly as fast as last season's Maxwell based Titan X. Tomb Raider is another game that looks absolutely stunning on a big 4K screen, and the fact that the 1080 Ti averages 77 FPS here means that with a single graphics card you can fully enjoy the experience. Here it was 28% faster than the GTX 1080. Titanfall 2 is a seriously fast paced first person shooter, so this is a game that would be popular with 144Hz owners. Coincidentally, the 1080 Ti averaged exactly 144fps at 1080p, with the quality settings maxed out. Even at 1440p, we're still seeing an average of 120 FPS with the 1080 Ti. Now at 4K, the average frame rate has been heavily reduced, as you would expect. Still, we are seeing an average of 72 FPS here, though this is just 10% faster than the standard 1080. Total War Warhammer is a game that I really feel should be played using the DX12 API, regardless of whether you're running AMD or Nvidia hardware. Like Ashes of the Singularity, during the battles when there are masses of units on screen, the CPU takes a good old pounding when using DX11. Anyway, even on DX12, the GTX 1080 Ti is still mighty fast, pushing over 100 FPS at all times at 1080p. At 1440p, frame rates are again very strong, and we often saw frame rates exceeding 100 FPS. Now finally at 4K, the average frame rate has been heavily reduced, as you would expect. Still with an average of 65 FPS, it was an impressive 30% faster than the standard 1080. Finally, Watch Dogs 2. This is the last game I've tested, I promise. Despite being a hugely demanding game on system resources, aka unoptimized, the GTX 1080 Ti still manages to reach 100 FPS on average. Even at 1440p, frame rates remain high, and Nvidia's new GPU is still good for 91 FPS, allowing it to match the Titan XP. Moving to 4K, the 1080 Ti is still 23% faster than the original 1080, as it went on to reach an average of 59 FPS. When compared to the GTX 1080, the 1080 Ti consumed just 7% more power, pushing the total system consumption to 334 watts, which is surprisingly low. Keep in mind we are using a custom board partner version for the GTX 1080, Gigabyte's G1 Gaming, but even then that's an impressive result for the 1080 Ti. That also means it's using less power than the Fury X despite delivering considerably more performance. Interestingly though, when compared to the Titan XP, the 1080 Ti reduced total system consumption by 8%, which is more than I expected to see. Now, I wouldn't say Nvidia's GTX 1080 Ti Founders Edition graphics card is loud when gaming, but you can certainly hear it over your case fans. 
Under load, the fan ran at 50% capacity, which sees it spinning at 2400 RPM. The thing pumps out some serious heat as well. Load temps quickly reached 80 degrees before maxing out at 84 degrees. At this temperature, the card would hold an operating frequency of at least 1670 megahertz. Please do note that when I unboxed the GTX 1080 Ti a few days ago, I did remove the cooler and wipe the thermal paste off to show you guys the die. The paste was replaced with something that looked quite similar, though there's no guarantee that wouldn't impact thermals one way or the other. As it turns out, I don't think this influenced the results too much. Kevin over at Tech Showdown confirmed operating temperatures of around 83 degrees. Well, if you came on that 20 game benchmark journey with me, uh, didn't skip ahead at any point and sat through all the benchmarks, then I guess it's safe to say you're having a pretty slow day. Anyway, I enjoyed checking out those games and I hope you did too. Uh, before we wrap things up, let's just summarize how the GTX 1080 Ti fared against the standard 1080 as well as the Fury X uh, for those of you who didn't have time to sit through all 20 games. When compared to the original GTX 1080, or the G1 gaming model that we use for testing, which was released almost a year ago now, the new TI model was on average 22% faster. We did see it deliver up to 30% more performance in titles such as Deus Ex Mankind Divided and Total War Warhammer. That said, at 4K the gains were sometimes as little as 10%. Still, for the most part, as that average figure suggests, the 1080 Ti delivered between 20 and 25% more performance. That said, it does come in at around 40% more expensive than the GTX 1080, but of course that's the premium you pay for high-end gaming, and with no alternative, there's no need for Nvidia to be more aggressive on pricing, at least for now anyway. The Fury X is just about eligible for the pension at this point, as it's just a few months off its second birthday. Two years is a long time to sit at the top of your product stack as the flagship offering. Anyway, the GTX 1082i puts the Fury X down in the most humane way possible, quickly dispatching of it with 61% more performance on average. As a side note, I believe what we're seeing here is the Fury X running into a VRAM capacity issue at 4K and Doom, and that's why it gets pantsed in a game where you would expect it to do significantly better than it did. As noted in a video I created about a month ago, unless you can pick up a Fury X graphics card for $300 US or less, I wouldn't bother. At that price, the 1080 Ti is obviously more than twice as expensive, and it's not twice as fast. That said, it's really GPUs such as the GTX 1070 that make the Fury X a bad buy at over $300. For those of you wondering, I will be putting together an in-depth overclock benchmarking video soon. I didn't really have time to cover that here, or more, I didn't want to stretch the video out any longer than I have, and I figured overclocking is usually best in its own video. Uh, but I don't expect much out of the Founders Edition card anyway. I'm guessing we'll squeeze maybe 10% more performance out, as we are running pretty close as it is out of the box to that 91 degree threshold. Uh, I imagine overclocking will be a lot better, or at least better, on a, a custom board partner card featuring a nice big cooler, something like what Gigabyte will produce with their Aorus product line. It's really the board partner cards that will make the GTX 1080 Ti truly exciting in my opinion. Pricing aside, the Titan XP is a seriously nice graphics card. Uh, well nice GPU as the graphics card only comes with the reference cooler which runs extremely hot, too hot to handle after a short gaming session and for me that kind of spoils it. Obviously we need not worry about the Titan XP anymore as the GTX 1080 Ti offers the same kind of performance while shaving a little over 40% off the asking price. Right now the 1080 Ti is the ultimate 4K gaming solution, or really just the ultimate gaming solution, as 1440p 144Hz gamers will also be chomping at the bit to get their hands on one. Until AMD releases Vega, I really don't expect to see any kind of shift in the GPU landscape. Still, knocking the vanilla GTX 1080 down to $500 US from the original $600 US asking price is a huge win for consumers. For us Aussies, it is now possible to purchase the GTX 1080 locally for just $700 AUD. I suspect Nvidia has done this to create a huge buzz around their high-end parts. They really enjoyed strong sales and profits in 2016, thanks to the GTX 1080 and 1070, or well, the whole Pascal lineup, really, if I'm honest. I imagine they are trying to recapture that magic once again in 2017, and I see no better way of doing that than cutting the GTX 1080 down to $500 and then bringing in a really impressive part like they have with the TI or the 1080 Ti at $700. And this will probably help take away a bit of attention from AMD's upcoming Vega. 
Anyway, the GTX 1080 Ti is mighty expensive at $700. Uh, nearly, where was I? Uh, what was my note? Right, I'm talking about the price. Uh, mighty expensive at $700. And I'm not going to deny that it is a very expensive graphics card, but at the same time, it's also delivering performance that we've really has been unheard of at this price. You can't get anything else that delivers nearly the same level of performance for $700. So Nvidia will certainly get away with charging that price. And I imagine as this video goes live, there'll be people somewhere in the world lining up to get their hands on one of these for the equivalent of $700 US. Um, speaking of which, locally, when you guys or the Australians wake up on Friday morning and head down to their favorite retailer to try and pick one of these up, the rumor is you will be stung around $1,200 AUD, which is quite a bit above the straight conversion from US dollars to Aussie dollars. So yeah, we're getting stung quite a price premium on top of the price premium for this card. Uh, but it is suggested that you'll probably be able to land one for about $1,000 AUD from uh, Amazon or Newegg. So keep that in mind. A bit sad that we can buy it so much cheaper after having paid shipping from the US ourselves. Um, and yeah, that kind of may have problems with warranty if you need to warranty the card down the track. But anyway, that's what it is. But yeah, at $700, I still think it is a great value product for high-end extreme gaming. For now, I'm keen to get my hands on a custom GTX 1080 Ti graphics card, because uh, yeah, I think they're going to be a lot more impressive as they often are, bigger coolers and whatnot. So yeah, I'll be grabbing one of them as soon as possible, hopefully in a week or two, and bringing you a review as quick as I can get that together. So with that, I'm going to go harass my contacts now. I'm your host, Steve. Hope to catch you again soon.